Um, uh, well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, we have a split presentation. It will be myself, Rosie Fraser, the project manager for the Tales from the Crypt project, and Laura Moffat, who is the director for Art and Christianity. Um, and our plan is to talk for 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so each. And um, if we have questions after each speaker, that probably would be easier for everybody rather than saving them all for the end. Um, but to be honest, I'm quite relaxed about how people want to ask questions so they can ask them whenever they want, really. Um, and but I can't see people so if you want to ask a question while I'm doing the presentation it's probably best to put it in the chat um and Laura perhaps if there is a question come up in chat could you let me know that would be brilliant um we are planning to record the presentations and then um they will be given to Andrew and put on the Islington Society website and we'll also put them on the Diocese of London website so there'll be plenty of places that you can get the recording um, if you want to do so. Also we've asked um, Andrew to send out a feedback questionnaire because um, this is a lottery funded project and therefore it's very important that we uh, secure feedback on how it's gone. Um, so my question for the first sort of 20 minutes or so of tonight is to talk about the uh, Tales from the Crypt project, which was a National Lottery Heritage Fund project. Um, and uh, it, really my plan is to sort of tell you how the project was conceived, how it developed, and um, now that we're getting to the end of it, what the next steps and future thoughts are for the building. So I just thought I'd start, I know you've probably seen this image before of a picture of um, Holy Trinity Church when it was first built. Um, and I know that you all know that it was completed in 1829 and designed by Sir Charles Barry, but I thought I would just um, put that in an introduction. Uh, it is obviously grade two star listed and it is on the historic England at risk register uh, category A, which means it is in the worst condition that it could be for a building at risk. Um, we've got issues with one of the turrets, which was struck by lightning and needs to be rebuilt. The, both the aisle roofs were at the point of collapse. Um, and fortunately, we've secured funding for that and are um, undergoing repairs to the roofs. We need to still repair the nave ceiling, which is also at danger and risk of collapse and we need to do considerable stonework repairs externally. And then internally, it needs a, a proper upgrade, new services, um, pretty much everything going. So there's a lot of work to be done to the building. Um, we undertook a feasibility study in 2018, funded by the Architectural Heritage Fund, which looked at some options as to how we might be able to reuse the building and costed the project out at 7 million which is quite a considerable sum of money. So with that information, we went to the lottery and we said, uh, we asked them about putting in a, a major capital application for up to 5 million grant funding. And they turned around and said that they thought we should focus on a community engagement program in the first instance to understand the community and um, engage with the community before we started embarking on a larger scale capital project. So with that feedback, that is precisely what we did. Um, and my talk tonight is obviously about that project that we've undertaken. And I just thought I would share some new images with you because we've recently um, had some new photographs commissioned. And this one is particularly nice with the scaffolding down and the towers. Um, re-wrapped in a rather more sympathetic material than previously so um, and for those who haven't seen it recently this is what the building looks like inside at the moment um, which is quite the building site but there we go um, so 
how did we actually go about doing our um, community program? First of all, and this is before I got involved, uh, the diocese had commissioned a community audit to try and understand all the different community groups um, in, the, in the location and to try and start to put out feelers as to who we might work with and who might be interested in using the building. Um, once we'd secured the initial feedback from the lottery fund, we then um, recruited a fundraiser to help put together the grant application for us. But the thing that perhaps was slightly different about this project from the number that I'd been involved in is that um, Kevin Rogers from the Diocese of London pulled together then the team of people that would be working on the project. And between us, we came together and we very much discussed and debated all the ideas that we thought would be um, good to be included. And um, we had a really interesting time scoping out how far we thought the project could go, what we could do. And that was just really, really interesting. And it was really nice to make it a, a well thought through project rather than just say one person coming up with some ideas. So having done that, the, the next step with the lottery is that you um, send a project inquiry form in. And in that you set out your outline project proposals and what you think your project outcomes will be. Um, and having received uh, approval to submit a grant application, we then scoped out and worked out the grant application together, and then that was submitted to the lottery. The team that Kevin pulled together, and you've obviously heard from Rebecca and Susan, they are both historians. Rebecca did the research on the building and Susan coordinated um, the volunteers who helped research the stories of the people in the crypt. I was brought on board as a project manager to try and coordinate everything and make sure that we complied with all our grant conditions and requirements. Um, we then brought on Laura from Art and Christianity to help us identify two artists to deliver the workshops with New River College um, Primary School. And so she knew Anna and Nia, and they've been fantastic, but she will talk more about that. And then Chris, who was one of our volunteers, was also a designer, and he came on board to design uh, all the exhibition uh, panels. So the partners that we worked with and that came to us from the community audit that was done previously were Islington Guided Walks, the Islington Society, yourselves, um, the Islington Museum, who are hugely supportive in terms of training the volunteers, and New River College. Um, I mean, in terms of fundraising, there are many different ways that you can go about this. Sometimes you would procure a consultant, other times you might secure a volunteer to help you, or if you're um, a church, a member of the PCC. It's not easy, obviously, fundraising. There's a lot of steps you have to go through. And the first step is you actually need to work out who you're going to apply to to secure the funding. And um, there are a number of search engines that you can go through to identify who might be a good match to ask for money. And um, some of the common sources at the bottom are local trusts and foundations. And um, our match funding that we secured for this project was actually Mayor of London funding from their Culture Seeds Fund. And that was quite an interesting one because I don't think I'd ever heard of that. I think it was possibly Laura who flagged up, why didn't we apply? So you, you're going to sort of work out who to apply to from many different sources. In terms of a timeline for working up a project, it took us about three months to do the community audit. Um, and then it took us a month to sit down and work out what we were going to submit in terms of a project inquiry to the Heritage Fund. Um, having then said, got the approval to submit the application, it then took us another two to three months to develop and submit the full application. They took six weeks to assess it and to send us an award letter. Um, it then took a further two months to be allowed to actually start the project because we have to pull together all the bits of administration and the match funding to allow us to proceed. 
And then we had an 18 month delivery program, which actually has extended to two years now because of the delays with COVID. So, you know, the total project timeline has been over two and a half years, and this is for um, a, a community project. So you can see that when we're doing a bigger capital project for Cloudsley, it's, it's going to take a long time to pull together the funding to do the development work and actually repair the building. So it sort of just gives you an indication of the timeframes involved. In terms of the Tales from the Crypt project itself, what we actually achieved was researching the history of the building, and that's Rebecca's work that's gone on the Diocese of London website, and she's given a talk um, as to what uh, her findings. Um, Susan was involved in recruiting and coordinating and working with the sort of 25 plus volunteers who researched the history of the people buried in the crypt. We originally thought we developed two guided walks with Islington walks for adults and children, but again, because of COVID that had to change um, and we just developed one walk. We have given and are giving three public talks. We've held our three legacy workshops and the workshops were very much about project, how you develop a project. And um, they were given to other churches and heritage organizations, some in London, but some across the UK because it was Zoom um, to, to basically impart our learning from the project. And then we worked with um, about six volunteers to curate and to um, develop the three month exhibition that was to be at Islington Museum. Um, clearly again, that had to change. Um, and then we worked with up to 24 pupils from New River College to do art workshops over the autumn term 2019. The pull-up banners haven't happened, but I'll explain a bit more about that in a minute. And then the research findings, as I said, have all gone on the LDF website. So here's a photograph of all the volunteers sharing their learning and findings from their research. Um, and I won't again do too much about this, but here's a photo from one of the art workshops held with New River College. And I do have the outcomes for the project. So basically when, when you get grant funding, you have to identify how your project will deliver lottery outcomes. And um, we managed to match up with eight of the lottery outcomes. And I won't read them all out, but um, you know, it just meant that our project had a good fit with what they were trying to achieve. And I think uh, the way that we worked together in a, in a project partnership made it a much better project and a much stronger project. Um, in terms of budget costs, so the total project cost is 58,000. We secured a lottery grant of 46,700. The diocese put in match funding of just over 6,000 and we secured the maximum culture seeds grant of 5,000, which pulled together the, the entire project costs. And um, my only comment about the budget was that in that we included 2,000 pounds of contingency, which is always extremely important because things always change in projects and it's always good to have a pot of money that you can dip into if you need to. And as it currently stands, we will have underspent by 500 pounds contingency at the end of the project. So I think we've done it pretty much on the nail. In terms of managing a project, um, the first thing we had to do was procure the consultants. Once we had the consultant team together, we then had monthly meetings. I um, insisted on having monthly reports from everybody so that all the information, all the details were captured because it's so easy to forget what happened. But everybody gave me monthly reports, which is brilliant. So we captured that information. And then obviously I have to deal with all the budgets and the invoicing. Um, I also have to report back to the lottery on a formal basis. I have to draw down the grant. Um, and then I have to feed all the information to our evaluation consultant who will be writing up an evaluation report early next year. And our final deadline uh, for submission with the lottery is February 2021. Um, I'd say probably from 
uh, the most challenging part of this project has clearly been COVID and having to deal with the changes that that's forced on us. Um, sadly, we had to move the exhibition out of Islington Museum. Um, it was open for one day before it closed due to lockdown. So we managed to move it on a very temporary basis to the Cloudsley Centre. Um, again, we struggled with lockdown, second lockdown number two. So we haven't had much luck, um, sadly, with this exhibition. We are possibly looking at trying to open it up for another um, four days and another four walks um, sometime in December and possibly a little bit in January. And then the other um, sort of casualty of COVID has been, we haven't done any pull-up banners. And one of the plans was we were going to do pull-up banners of the exhibition and then do a walk, um, a, a tour of the Islington libraries so that we could just sort of get out further the, the messages and the learning from the project. But again, sadly, most of the Islington libraries have not reopened. So we just scrapped that part of the project. Moving on then to where we are today, and we've secured Historic England funding to repair the Isle roofs and we completed repairs to the South Isle roof in September. We're on target to complete the North Isle roof repairs um, at the end of January 2021. Uh, we've also managed to rewrap the turrets and take the scaffolding down from the West End. So hopefully, you know, we can see some tangible progress. And the most important thing is that we're trying to make the building safe to occupy as it currently stands. I thought you might be interested to see some photographs from the repair works from the South Isle roof. So the photo on the left uh, shows the temporary roof, which was put up as part of the scaffolding to keep the rain off. You can see here um, the extent of the rot um, in the wall plates, which is, it, it, this is just an element. It was more catastrophic in a number of places. Um, then you can see these are the repairs, the joinery repairs and the steel supports that have gone in to strengthen the roof. And when I was up inspecting the turrets, I took a photograph of the uh, South Isle roof uh, having been reslated. So these are our current photographs. Now, hopefully, I asked William Fuller, who's the managing director of Fuller's Builders, to just do a couple of little snippets about some of the repairs. So I'm going to try and play these for you, and hopefully they will work. Hi, I'm William Fuller. I work for Fuller's Builders, and our team are currently working at the Cloudsley Centre in Cloudsley Square in Islington in London. Just going to show you some of the additional strengthening works that we've been doing to the roof void here. As you can see that our team have installed this purpose made steel work. It's going to provide a lot more rigidity to the structure and will help the roof take the loads of the new insulation and roof coverings. And hi, I'm William Fuller. I work for the No, I think that's the wrong team. one. Hang on, hang on. Here's the next one. Sorry. Hi, my name is William Fuller. I work and our team are working at the moment at the Mousy Centre in Mousy Square and I'd like to show you some of the repair works that we're undertaking. Just here you can see that our team are preparing some new catch pits that will collect the water. We're going to line these in lead. The roof has leaked quite heavily in the past and decayed some of the structure and we hope that these large catch pits will stop the gutters and down pipes from blocking. Oh, my name is oh sorry. Ah. So um, next steps, we have been invited to apply for um, a further Historic England grant to repair the nave ceiling. Um, and this is fantastic news because the nave ceiling is, is also at risk of collapse. And if we can then um, have repaired the aisle roofs and ceilings and the nave ceiling, then although the building isn't in a good condition, it is actually safe to occupy. And that means that we would then be looking at potentially renting it out on a short-term basis as artist studios. Those are our current thinking. Um, and then that will then give us time to work up a major funding bid to the lottery, ideally in the summer of 2021. 
and um, to start to fundraise for the capital works. And we are also planning to do some works to the crypt, which ideally will commence in summer 2021 and will take approximately 12 to 14 months to complete. So those are the next steps for the building. We're trying very hard to secure its future. And um, uh, yes, that these projects are uh, quite challenging, but also great fun at the same time. So thank you. And um, if anybody has any questions on the presentation, do let me know. Nick. As usual. <laughs> Um, thanks very much, Rosie. Um, I'm, uh, I was a volunteer on the project and um, a member of the Cloudsley Association, so the local community. Um, it's a great project, but it could be even better if, um, if you just did one thing, I think. I think you, there's room for improvement on communication and particularly communication via a website, right? There's, yep. there's some stuff on the diocese website, but it's difficult to find. There's not much there and it's not very exciting. And, and particularly for the Tales for the, from the Crypt um, project, you know, it was crying out for, for a website for all the results to be put up on, on the as, as they were found out. And that never really happened. And, and as a result, the Clouds of the Association felt obliged to, um, to update our own website. But I sense that, you know, that's, that wasn't a perfect outcome from you. So, so if I was you, I'd go to whoever's responsible for the diocese website, kick them up the bum, <laughs> and, uh, or failing that, set up your own. Because I do think it's, it's very important as a communications medium. No, no, and I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily disagree. Um, so, you know, but you can imagine these things are, have sensitivities around them. So, um, maybe the best thing we can do is try and secure some additional funding to set up a website that's dedicated to the project and that might be the best way to crack on. Uh, are there any other questions on that presentation? Any other, anybody got anything? No, oh, here we go. Sorry, Rosie. Yes. Uh, Rachel Bauer, so I live at the southwest corner of the church yeah and i owe you some presentations yes please don't fret um i'm just very interested we didn't hear william's um second clip i know william quite well um, yeah. and he was talking about a trap i've never all my days in spam and so on i've never seen a, some sort of water trap like that well it's it's a catch it's a catch pit so it's going to be lined with um lead yeah. Yeah. and it has a cover on it it has a it has a grill cover on it so it stops the leaves going down and then that links into the hopper which has an overflow spout as well so the hopper the, the down pipes are four by six which is bigger than the yeah, standard yeah, drain pipe. Yeah, no, they're good. And, and they'll have an, a sort of a cathedral overflow spout. So even if it is blocked, it can still whoosh, yeah. away from yeah. the building. So we're trying really, really hard to make sure that um, there isn't water ingress, which has basically been the issue that the buildings had and why all yeah, this yeah. is rotten and all the roofs have been at risk. Um, to and make it's, sure- yeah, It's still got lots of trees. Yeah. So, the, so the plan is, um, I think they're going to be pollarded next summer to try and bring them back in terms of size uh, by about the third, I believe. Um, and also Kevin is putting in place a, a, a much better maintenance plan for a number of the churches in the diocese to uh, 
you know, to, to make sure that the gutters are cleared out at least twice a year, because that is, is the key problem. They all get clogged right. up the leaves yeah. and then... So we're, we're trying quite hard to avoid the problems Good. from the Excellent. Heart. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I take that point. Uh, where are we? So to what use will the church space be put when the building is complete? Um, the options appraisal looked at um, office space and community space. And um, clearly, we don't quite know how much of a market we're going to have for office space. So um, we are looking at potentially um, education uses as well. So it, it's a mix of uses. We are about to start developing a business plan and um, we will consult again on uses at that point so that the local community um, and residents can have a say in terms of uses, because I know that that's something that you'll all be very interested in. Were there any other questions? Uh, I thought I saw somewhere on, maybe it was on the community website that the YMCA were talking about renting the whole building and using it for their offices and uh, activities. They were indeed, but I'm afraid they pulled back from that. So we are looking at um, new potential tenants and um, we're in discussions with a couple of people at the moment, a couple of organisations, um, but we'll probably go and advertise the space early next year just to see what potential users might be out there. Um, so if that's it, shall I pass over to Laura? Um, Laura Loft Moffat is the Director for Art and Christianity and she's going to talk about the art workshops element of the Tales from the Crypt project and also a little bit more broadly about artists in residence. Thank you. I am. Hmm. Wait a minute. You don't want to see that. <laughs> or that. <laughs> Sorry. Just trying to share my screen with you. That's better. Okay. Um, full screen. Right. Go back to the beginning. It's a little bit slow, I think, but there we are. Okay, thank you, Rosie. Uh, can everyone see the slides? Little nod. Is that appearing on your screens? Great. Okay, marvelous. Um, yes, thank you. I, I, I'm, um, as Rosie has said, director of an organization called Art and Christianity, which is uh, a national organization, but based here in London. And um, I'm also involved slightly with the diocese. I, I sit on one of their committees on buildings and things. So, um, I was asked to uh, come in and try and help with the project to uh, fulfill the sort of community engagement side of it, which quite rightly, um, you know, we, we look to using artists to do that and talk a bit more about that later. Um, but uh, I thought we'd start by kind of broadening things out a little bit, perhaps just sort of discussing the whole kind of concept of what um, artists might bring to heritage uh, projects, particularly if there's a kind of need for, um, uh, you know, satisfying funders, uh, demands for community engagement, that kind of thing. Um, so I was going to share with you to begin with a few uh, examples of uh, heritage artist residencies basically there are quite a number that are really well established now um, there's even a, a, an organization called arts and heritage um, the national trust have a really significant um, i'm gonna i'm actually just gonna flick to my web browser actually because i've brought up a few of these for you to see my twitter feed not, not. here we go so um this is just, for instance, the, the National Trust's um, web page for, it's a program they call, I'll take you up to the top here, Trust New Art. And in a, in a quite a large number of their properties or, or um, 
you know, uh, natural sites, they have commissioned artists, contemporary artists to work with the, either with the, the landscape around them or with the collection itself. Um, there's a nice one here, the workhouse in Southall. Um, so you can see the, the variety of, um, you know, at times I think that there are sort of, you know, huge kind of installations or creations made, but at other times it might be um, a sound piece or a kind of performance, that kind of thing. Um, some of the other biggies, we've got the National Gallery who have an annual um, residency program for just one single artist who is normally a sort of mid-career artist, so usually quite a, a big name, quite well established, and they're given a sort of free reign to, to work with the collection to make responses to it, and then they're, they're given a, a nice gallery show at the end of it. Another quite interesting one, I think, um, is Vital Arts, who are the um, commissioning body for the Barts Health NHS Trust. So that huge new building at the Royal London, uh, the new buildings at Barts, everywhere uh, in the whole trust, which is growing. Um, I mean, they're now at Whips Cross. This, this piece you're seeing now is at Whips Cross Hospital. Um, Vital Arts have an extraordinary um, um, back catalogue now, if you like, of, of contemporary artists who have um, been asked to make work for the hospitals. Um, not always, not always really site specifically, but but very often they are. So there's a lot of murals, there are a lot of um, really fun installation pieces or large sculptures, that kind of thing. Um, this is in in the Victorian building, and the artist here drew on the, um, well, its proximity to Epping Forest. It's right, right across the road from uh, Epping Forest. Also to the, um, we've got a little bit of writing here, the Magic Lantern Slides she discovered in the Epping Forest and Vestry Museum archives. Uh, what else have we got? So there's um, also, uh, a nice one here. This is a, it is actually in a church, um, a set of churches in Romney Marsh, uh, but it's not so much for that that I chose it because they're not, they're not. I mean, the, the group of people that organise this are not anything to do with the church. Obviously, they have um, the collaboration of the churches in that area, but it's a secular. Um, it's a secular organization that runs it usually once every two years and um, very much drawn uh, from again sort of the churches within their landscape um, they're, they're quite remarkable the churches they're very very isolated very rural and um, you can see a nice little map there um, so they, they commission usually one or two invited artists slightly bigger names, well-known names from outside the area. And then they offer also um, a kind of open competition to local artists to make proposals for different churches in the area. And then they create a trail, as I say, one, once every two years. Um, right, let's whiz back now to the, back to here. Um, I will also just kind of name check, if you like, the, the um, cathedral residency schemes, which if, if you like, um, I think almost kind of blazed a trail. Uh, Durham Cathedral was one of the very first to do it and um, commissioned, uh, well, had as res in residence Bill Viola in the early days. I don't know if anyone um, was aware of the sort of an amazing piece called The Messenger, which was made for Durham Cathedral and has gone on to be shown in lots of lots of other sacred spaces, but also lots of big, big museum shows too. Um, so that, that was a really significant scheme that began, I think, about 20 years ago and, and actually doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. Likewise with Gloucester, which was sort of copying Durham, sort of managed for a few years then had to close and both uh, both places didn't manage to continue because of funding and it's always going to be an issue. So uh, we'll, we'll come on to funding and the sort of 
role that plays perhaps in a minute. I'm just going to also whiz you through a, a couple of projects that we've been involved with. Um, in 2017, we worked in Newcastle with a city centre church there as part of a, a festival called Platforma, which celebrated uh, migration immigrants, artist immigrants, um, and the work they do in this country when they arrive. It's a, it's a sort of itinerant festival, so it goes to a different city every two years again. Um, and this year, uh, the, sorry, the, the year I'm talking about in 2017, um, our artist uh, that we chose, Katia Camelli, worked with the local migrant groups in the area to produce these um, uh, designs for what are normally plain Victorian glass windows. So you can imagine in the church, I'll come, let me skip through that slide. Uh, here we go. Um, there is There were six of these large Victorian plain glass windows and she developed designs that represented different countries uh, from which the, the migrants came. Um, so China, Iran, the DRC, uh, where are the others? Um, well, that's another one. Anyway, you can you you get the idea. They were lo lovely, vibrant designs, and they really they really changed the church. And it was quite a nice um, it was quite a nice way of making an intervention in a in a really, you know, a very historic church, part of the building is medieval, uh, but without sort of getting in the way. So there was nothing that people were gonna trip over or got in the way of services or anything like that. So quite a clever sort of intervention in that sense. Another church we worked with was um, a very rural church in Kingston, just outside Cambridge. And this was where um, we were asked actually as a sort of pre-HLF um, funding bid. So the church wanted to, to sort of show that they were capable of engaging with their local community in order to make an HLF bid uh, to fix the roof. Um, they are the lucky um, owners, if you like, of these extraordinary medieval paintings, wall paintings in the church. You can see some of them there just above the, um, the nave aisle, but also here, this wonderful um, psychomachia painting. Um, so an artist was asked to respond to those medieval wall paintings. Um, she was a fairly local artist. She lives in Cambridge, but she also has a studio at the nearby Weising Art Centre. And it was thought it was a good, I, I mean, we went to Weising originally to ask if one of their studio artists could, could fulfill this residency for us. And we felt that it was a good idea to, to go to um, local artists in this case. Um, she responded with this quite extraordinary um, set of new uh, vestments. I'm coming to them. She also made that um, neon sign that was installed, but here are the vestments she made. And I don't know if you can read, probably can't read from that slide what they are, that's just to show you how they were installed, which again was without touching any of the historic fabric, we constructed these um, sort of hangers, which were just using fishing wire, just sort of strapped to the to the pillars there. Um, but there was a, so there was a play on um, animals and what we expect of animals or what we expect their characteristics to be, uh, sort of turning that on its head a little bit, um, as a, as a response to the, uh, the seven virtues and the seven vices. So moving you swiftly onwards, here's our goat of chastity, <laughs> um, to Cloudsley Square, where, um, as Rosie said, we were asked to find a couple of artists to, to carry out the work there. And um, I must admit, Anna, I knew Anna well, uh, but I didn't know Nir at all. Anna put me in touch with Nir um, and suggested that between the two of them, they had the right kind of, um, I think in as much as anything, it was very good to have a man and a woman, just to be very blunt about it. And, and she said that to me and I, <laughs> I think I totally agreed. Um, it was such a nice thing to do. I think Rosie probably hasn't used this quote and I hope I'm getting it right, but the headmaster, when we um, approached them about working with them, said, oh yeah, this is great. No one ever wants to work with us. And, and we just thought, wow, that's, 
you know, what, what an opportunity really um, to work with kids from this pupil referral unit, kids that have been excluded from mainstream education, very often obviously having difficult backgrounds, difficult home life. Of course that had its limitations. So we were only able to work with um, a fairly small number of children at one time. And it was never very easy to say which children would be in on any one day. There was, you know, there's quite a lot of absenteeism, obviously. Their days are also shorter than normal days. Anyway, with all that in mind, we carried out our, um, was it 10? I think it was 10 altogether. No, 12, 12 workshops um, over the, uh, this equivalent of this term last year. We began with um, talking quite a lot with the children about memory. So Nir introduced uh, them to some of the ideas in uh, an animation film called Coco, which explores the Mexican Day of the Dead festivals. Um, so thinking about memories about people they might have lost, obviously this you know, could have gone either way perhaps, but um, I, I think it was actually quite a good way in for them. Um, they also introduced ideas of color and they brought in these large um, sort of sheets of color, which projecting through them, they were able to make these silhouettes. Now, they'd also been looking at the, the little lovely sort of Victorian cameo images of that are silhouetted of portraits. Um, so they, they were taking on those ideas. They had some games where they were sort of exploring, you know, can you tell what this object is just by the silhouette or taking on a character themselves. So, you know, perhaps using some props, hats and things that, that had been borrowed for that, um, that workshop there. You'll see those images, I think, coming back a bit later on. So that silhouette imagery got carried through into this work with, um, with some light boxes that were brought in and also using the windows, just the windows on the classrooms, colored acetate, and then these pre-cut, obviously, um, stickers, black silhouette stickers that, that Anna and Nir had, had pre-prepared for them. But we got some wonderful um, collages, sort of um, things that, We've got some here, yeah. So things that uh, parents could see from the outside when they came to pick up children. Uh, and of course, this, this led to lots of conversations about what the area might have been like back in the, you know, in the mid 19th century, what, what it was like for the children, particularly living there at that time. We then got into some workshops where they were concentrating on mark making. So sort of taking them through some of the different ways they might uh, make a mark. And they were, um, ex they were exposed to a kind of Victorian school in that they had old fashioned little um, blackboards with, with uh, uh, you know, a bit of chalk and did lots of mark making on those which were photographed before they were wiped out. Um, and then they were uh, allowed to make their own clay tiles too with little stamps as you can see there, but, but just exploring um, what that mark making might be. I think there was quite a lot of conversation too about materials and you know where clay came from and London clay and all that kind of thing. So introducing them to ideas around sort of his history and, and geography at the same time. Another aspect, this is um, a photo, the main photo from um, the installation that was put together for the museum. You, you may recognize the, the windows there from the front of the museum. Um, so it was all installed there, obviously, including the, some of the children's work. Um, anyway, wasn't to be, but um, Bells came into it in, a, in quite a big way. And I think this went back to some of uh, Susan Sked's um, sessions. She did a couple of sessions with the children telling stories, uh, historical stories, and particularly using the idea of, you know, of bells, what are bells rung for? And, and telling them about when bells would be rung for the, the funerals of, of children dying at a very, very young age. So each child was given a, a clay bell that they were able to mark um, and paint, and then they were they were fired 
so then um let's see what else another session was uh um, a marbling session so another thing that they'd um, been shown were old ledger books with beautiful marbled papers on the inside and I'm not <laughs> I, I went into the school when this was happening and I think they only had four children at once but it was quite high risk because um, obviously it involves oil paints floating on water and everything but they made their own marbled papers and created invitations borrowing from this um there's a there's a lovely image and i don't think i've got it here i'm sorry um but a lovely image of um a shield from the church saying welcome to cloudsley church or whatever it is uh, holy trinity cloudsley square and so they borrowed from that shield design and made their own invitations for their parents to come and see the exhibition that they put on uh in the school before the the museum exhibition happened uh, here are the artists, the lovely artists, Anna and Nir. Um, these wonderful light boxes actually were made quite early on, I think, um, using little sort of, I think they're like disposable lunch boxes and a little string of, of lights that just run on a battery. So, you know, again, using sort of clear coloured acetate, they, they created those light boxes. And very sweetly, you know, I've, I've, I've got a couple of um, comments written down here from um, children from that that workshop where they one of them said this this is for someone I love and um, and very often asking whether they could take things home with them afterwards as well so I think this is probably the final slide this is just obviously the exhibition within the church which although short-lived um, I think was well worth doing and some of the light boxes appearing there I think I shall stop there because probably about my time and could allow for questions if you have any. Do you want to stop on screen sharing? Yes. And we can see if anybody's got any questions. Rebecca's got to, oh, Rebecca and then George. Um, thank you both, if I'm allowed to ask a question. <laughs> um, Laura, one of the, um, the images you showed of a church, and I forget now where, of the stained glass intervention, mm. was that temporary or permanent? It was temporary, yeah. It was permanent, it was great. I know, <laughs> a few people said um, they'd quite like it to stay. I mean, people from the church. But um, how was it done? Newcastle DAC is not is not particularly. It was a little. It was a little bit difficult getting permission just to do it in the first place. Um, but it was up for quite a long time. So it was up for three months, I think. Um, so yeah, it felt a bit of a waste to me. It was um, yeah. There was a lot of plastic involved, which I regret slightly disposed of and um but it but it would be quite i mean I, you wouldn't even need to do it on that scale again for it to be quite effective i think you could you could do something on a much smaller scale with acetates i think in, in within churches and you know there's so much to play with 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 the all the history of stained glass that i think yeah it'd be nice to see it again at some point thank you interesting I think George had a question. Muted and unmuted. <laughs> oh, no, I'm muted again. No. <laughs> You could just type it into chat if you like. Well, the unmuting here. Um, right, can you hear me now? We can, yes. can. Right, okay. Uh, no. <laughs>
It's uh, the uh, lottery fund required that um, the uh, uh, um, as a condition of its grant for a, a relatively modest forty six thousand going to be applying to them for possibly millions of pounds, then presumably they will require community project orders of magnitude um, greater than that. Uh, and I wondered if you have any ideas what those might be. Well, yes. Um, what we would like to do is, because we stopped the research of the uh, stories of the people in the crypt in 1854 when um, no more burials were permitted in crypts and we would like to follow that research and the history of the area through to today's date as the next sort of piece of, of historical research um, and work that back into a volunteer project again. Um, we would also like to do quite a bit around um, more artist intervention and engagement. Um, potentially, we would like to run a competition um, and to um, design a new stained glass window in one of the smaller um, uh, windows on the north elevation. Um, we've, we've got a number of projects that we would like to run in terms of community engagement, but certainly if people had ideas and thoughts following on from the first project, I would be really pleased to hear them. Um, because obviously ideas that come from the community often work the best. Just out of interest as well, Rosie, is it, I mean, is that right that, you know, the bigger your, your capital grant, the bigger your community engagement has to be or your, or, or does it, does it, is it not quite proportional? In it that wouldn't, it would, no, it wouldn't be proportional, um, but it certainly would need to be of, um, it, it would need to be, it would need to, to make a difference. Mm. You know, it's quite simple. It would need to be a significant piece of community engagement that uh, was relevant and meaningful. Mm. Um, the scale and extent of that is obviously to be determined. Yeah. I think, I mean, I hope I'm not putting my foot in it by mentioning, but we at some point we talked a little bit about the possibility of working with New River College, mm. but with their... Um, with their secondary unit as well yes um, certainly they were great I mean they were they were lovely to work with weren't they and um, I think that could be yeah but yes there are loads of possibilities and um, we'll be very keen to try and continue to work with as many of our project partners as we as we possibly can and work with new ones as well that's the plan but as I said realistically you know um, the focus at the moment is on emergency repairs to get the building safe and sound and then to turn our thoughts to um, a major capital project and it's quite hard to run both in tandem in terms of time and resource. Um, going back to the, your last point there. Does there have to be, um, can there be any length of time between the two or, or can, can the length of time between the two be variable between finishing making, making the building watertight and safe and then coming up with a new scheme and putting in a bid? Oh no! I mean, like it, 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 it can be years it, later, or it could be years later. It could, right. We could put an expression of interest come February twenty twenty one, which is when the lottery are reopening for major applications. I don't think we'll be in a position to put it in in February twenty twenty one, but certainly um, 
you know, we will be starting to, to take soundings and reach out again and try and pull together ideas and um, and to think about how we can pull a project together because Kevin is obviously very keen that we do progress and, um, you know, we won't dilly dally. So were there any other questions? If there aren't any questions, Rosie, could I thank you both from the Islington, Islington Society? And um, you know, if there is any way in which we can continue to be involved, then we would obviously like to. Maybe we can talk at some point about how we can help. No, that because be it good. really has been the most amazing project. And what, uh, watching the, the three presentations over the last three months has been quite extraordinary. I think the work that's been done is uh, astonishing. Um, and we're all very pleased to be involved in it. So thank you all for what you've done for us. No, no, it's brilliant. And, and thank you for your help as well, because it's so much easier to work with local conduits and to, to get our information out that way. Otherwise, it's so hard for us, you know, to, to let people know what's going on. So it's been brilliant. Thank you. Joy, if David, is there anything you'd like to say? Are you still there? David Gibson? Still here, thank you. Yes, it, no, it's a, we're all really looking forward to the whole thing being completed, so. <laughs> oh, no pressure. No, I know. <laughs> Can, well, can I just say how interesting it is? It's lovely to hear. Um, so, um, Rosie's it worries me, Rosie. It's calling you Kevin Rogers. But, <laughs> Sorry. Um, it, it's lovely to hear you've broken it down to all these steps, and and I know from sort of bitter experience just how much work is involved in all of those. But you made it sound so simple and straightforward, which gives me faith. And <laughs> then Laura's presentation, I I haven't heard nothing about. Um, arts and Christianity, and I think it's wonderful. I think the things that you did with the kids, they, they deserve something mm. like that, and, and hooray that they seem to respond. Um, yeah, another, something else to be explored for, for the bigger ones. Indeed it is, and we will, don't worry. Yeah, most interesting, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you all. That was really great. Thank you. Bye. Can I just put a plea out then? Um, when you get sent the evaluation, oh, sorry, carry on. When you get sent the evaluation survey, would you please fill it out for us? That would be really great. <laughs>